Praise the Lord. It's time for us to put across any question we might have as it concerns the study today. The birth of Isaac, heir of the promise. Please, if you have any question, can you rise up and come forward? Yes, that brother that just came out, yes. My question is from the um, second point of today's lesson. And I will read from Genesis 21, verse 9 and 10. Sarah saw the son of Agar the Egyptian, which she had born unto Abraham, mocking. Wherefore he said unto Abraham, Cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And uh, Abraham obeyed and sent them away according to what we learned today. Then my question is, in a believer's life, the believer started his life, a man and a woman in immorality, and uh, through that immorality, a child was born. But along the line, the man gave his life to Christ. But since then, the woman that gave birth to that child has been living with him. And the persecution from the woman inside the family is so much that even she has to disrupt the prayer life of the man. With all uh, advice, counsel, and praying, even preaching to her by the man that has given his life to Christ, she said she is not ready to serve the God that that man has given himself to. What should a believer do in this kind of situation? Thank you. Any other person with any question? Anybody? Yes. Please. Yes, come forward and put your question. Good morning, sir. We have learned today about the birth of uh, Isaac. So what I want to ask is uh, in a family where a, a polygamous house family and the, the man married two wives and there is late, just like as we read in the book in the life of David. And now the children, the man has some, you know, some properties. And the, the first wife's children said that they are the ones that, that have everything, that the second wife does not have any right with the children to the property. He married the second wife legitimately. I know that uh, as a you know, Bible uh, student, second wife, uh, I'm not there to, I'm not to, to judge or to say the second wife should go. But so what I want to ask is that, is it a right for the, the second wife not to inherit with the children, not to have any part in the property of the man? That's my question, sir. Sorry, before you go, you said uh, he married the second wife legitimately. Um, yes, sir. He married her and he has, she has children for, her, for, for the man and now the man is late. And the property that the man had, the first wife and the children wanted to sit on it and said that both the children of the second wife will not share, will not have any part in the, in the property. The, this man, is he a believer? He's not a believer. Okay, thank you. Let's uh, look at the two questions. The first question has to do with a wife that was not legitimately married. Eventually they had children and the man, I suppose, eventually got converted but his wife refused to give her life to Christ and the question is what does the husband who now is a believer do in that circumstance to begin with let us 
understand clearly that marriage is very, very sacred. It's not something we go into without carefully looking at it from the perspective of the Almighty God, particularly as it concerns us as believers. Marriage is honorable. God sanctioned it from the, from the word go. If you look at Genesis chapter 2, From verse 24, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. It's a very serious issue seeing that God Almighty from the very beginning ordained it to be so. Now, in the present day world, a lot of things are called marriage which and not really. There are steps to take to be properly married and then have children. One of them is that there has to be the attainment of the age of marriage. Beyond that, you have to have the consent, of course, of the two parties that are going to marry. Beyond that, you have to have the consent of parents that are concerned in, in, in the union. And then, Finally, you have to seek the blessing of God so that God will be in the foundation. From the question our sister asked, that union, in as much as, according to her question, was based on immorality, just like it happens so frequently, it's, it's very prevalent now, that people just see somebody and begin to live with that person and they do not fulfill all the four conditions I have earlier enumerated. Somebody could be a customer to a trader and comes constantly to buy from him or her, and from there, they feel that they, they love themselves and they get married without anybody like the parents knowing about it. Many people are living like that today, even as we speak. If somebody is cohabiting with a woman or a man and there was no consent from the parents of the woman that they agreed volitionally to hand over their daughter to you as a wife that is not marriage in the real sense of it so that particular instance our sister was talking about cannot be properly called marriage in the context of, the, of, of Christianity so they have children or a, chi a child now and it's like because they have a child the question our sister was asked, or the brother who asked the question was trying to imply that the having of a child confers legitimacy on that union in as far as there was no consent there was no dowry paid the fact that you have a child with another woman does not therefore make that union legitimate in the sight of God. And then we, ha we now have the, the, the problem that the woman, after having the child, became very recalcitrant that she doesn't want to listen and she's giving trouble. So what does the brother now, who has now converted, what does he do? He has to start right. Go back, make the ways right. He has to find how to get back to the parents of this woman and see, by the grace of God, with proper counseling from spiritual leaders, how to handle the situation to make it, uh, you know, right from the, the, the family where the, uh, the sister comes from. Now, the, the, the fact that the sister is not submissive, is giving a lot of trouble in the home, uh, does not in any way mean that the brother is uh, free to throw her out like that. No. In as much as they have cohabited and they can rectify whatever wrong they have done. Now, you cannot do wrong while trying to correct what is wrong. 
you cannot say because the woman is giving trouble, therefore you throw her out, marry a second wife, and all that. That will not be in tandem with the mind of God. Whatever you see there, you remain steadfast in the Lord and pray. Just like we have learned today that God can do a lot of things if we really pray and depend on God by faith. The second question was about inheritance and again it's also in, in, in uh, like relating to what people call marriage but it's not really marriage. This is a case of polygamy. From the beginning the mind of God is and has always been that a man should marry just one wife. If it was not so, if it was the mind of God for us to marry more than one, God would have made it so from the beginning. And so that's why he's finding the same place I've read before, first Genesis chapter 1 verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave the father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. A man leave his father, cleave unto his wife. You see that the man is single, singular, and the wife as well is singular. This question came up in the New Testament and from there we have the privilege of the perfect explanation as given by the Lord to this matter of polygamy. Polygamy has never been the institution of God. It, is, it started quite early, like we know, even the, in the Old Testament time. The first polygamist that we have in the Bible was a man called Lamech. I want you to turn with me to Genesis chapter 5. I want to read from verse 19. And Lamech took unto him two wives. The name of the one was Ada, the name of the other Zillah. So this is the commencement. This man is not, was not a godly man. He was not of the godly line. And that's why he began to do as he pleases, as he pleased, without reference to the mind of God, which a believer cannot do today. Everything we do must be God-directed. And so it pleased him to marry two, and he did so. But let, for you to know the kind of person uh, that man is, that started this deviation from the mind of God, look at verse 23. And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. So you see, he's a violent person. So he started a wrong thing against the will of God. And you know, when bad people start bad example, if care is not taken, even good people are drawn into that wrong action. That's what's happening in the custom and traditions we have around us in our various places. People who did not know God, didn't reckon with God, they started doing one thing or another. It became a tradition. And they want, now they want everybody, even if you're a Christian, you must follow that line. So because Lamech started this does not mean that it is the mind of God. He was a bad person. And we cannot follow a multitude to do what is wrong. We had an opportunity for the Lord Jesus to clear this question in Matthew chapter 19. I want to read from verse 27. Matthew chapter 19, verse 27. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Behold, we have forsaken all and followed thee. What shall we have? 
therefore. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, he also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Now look at verse 29. And everyone that has forsaken houses, you will notice that most of the things the Lord spoke about in that verse 29 are in plural. He wanted it to be expansive. So he said, and everyone that has forsaken houses or brethren, brethren is a plural word, or sisters, or father. Now you, you meet the first singular word because it's impossible for somebody to have two fathers. So houses, brethren, sisters, but when he came to father, because father must be one, one person, he said father or mother. Mother, nobody has two mothers. The same way, then he said, or what? What did he say? And, or what? Wife. So there are things that cannot be made plural. And anyone that is making those things plural is not only disobeying God, but is disobeying nature. The mind of God who created us is that we should have one father, one mother, one wife. So if anybody, for, and people have their reason, reasons in quotes, well, there's no reason for disobedience. There's no counsel against the Lord. All we need to do is to uh, come back, come away from our wrong way and align ourselves with the word of God. There is somebody in the times past when he was in the darkness of not knowing God, has married multitude of wives. He has to take steps to rectify the situation. You see counsel from our leaders and they will guide you on what to do so that you come back to the path of rectitude. Now, concerning inheritance and all those things, you see, when you have a family like that, like everything that God commands, when we get out of it, when we disobey God, we should be prepared for trouble. Anytime we deviate from the mind of God, even if that trouble does not come immediately, wait for it, it will surely come. The same thing when we do what is right. The, th the truth is that sin will always bring reproach. Sin will always bring shame. It may not be immediate, but ultimately, the same thing with righteousness. So when people deviate and they now marry three, four, however many wives, there's always a problem. Even in the Old Testament, people who married two wives, three wives, they didn't quite, they didn't enjoy the blessings and the peace of God as those who obeyed God by having monogam, uh, mono, mono, monogam, <laughs> the monogamous uh, 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 marriage. We need to understand this clearly and run away from the trouble we pull down upon our, ourselves. Look for example, a good man like Jacob, he married two wives but he didn't have rest. There was envy, even though the wives were sisters, but that natural affection could not stop the evil of disobedience. And they were always fighting, there was envy, and there was a lot of problem. On the other hand, you know, uh, um, Rachel did not have a, a, a son early, and then he was making trouble. Look at the life of Isaac, who was submissive to the mind of God, who waited for the will of God, whose marriage was based on prayer, who traveled to meet the parents of the wife-to-be, who did everything according to the mind of God, and they got married properly. And then there was some delay, there was trouble, delay in, in having a child. But you see the difference Whereas between Rachel and Leah, there was fighting, there was envy, there was all kinds of 
malicious behavior towards each other, and the family was not in peace at all. That affected Joseph and the rest of the brethren, as we know the story. But look now at the family of Isaac. When there was delay, Isaac, because he's a child of God, and heir of the promise of God, all these many years, for about 20 years, there was no child. We did not see Isaac looking for a Hagar or going to any woman in the excuse that the wife did not have a child. He remained steadfast looking unto God. What Isaac did, which is our example, whenever there is difficulty or challenge, is to look unto God and pray. So he, uh, he entreated God for his wife. And what happened? God answers, as God always does. And so we see the difference that the line of people who want easy path, who do not reckon with God's mind, their own law is their own convenience. And there's no eye to pleasing God. In that process, they get into trouble. They will never benefit. Nobody can benefit by doing wrong. It's just the deception of sin that makes people believe that they can deviate. It's convenient. Nobody will bother. Nothing will happen. The Bible says it's a lie to say that you disobey God and nothing will happen. But look at a man represented here by Isaac who was faithful to God, who will say, whatever the case, I will remain with God. Like the question the sister put, what would the, the man has to remain with God. He has to obey God. He has to pray. He can, nothing can justify disobedience to God. Nothing. So he has to stay steadfast in the mind of God until God, by his power, will bring about a change. This morning we studied about the power of God to make good his promise. After so long a time, and yet, God fulfilled his promise. So we should learn from here that God will fulfill what he said. We should do the right thing. If there's a challenge, wait for it. God will ultimately confirm his word and will confirm the truth, uh, the, 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 the goodness of obedience in every situation. We should not be so much afraid of suffering. This is what the devil always does. He dangles suffering in our eyes and we become so frightened that we begin to look for an easy way outside the mind of God. That should not happen at all. We should not be afraid of suffering. Why we are so much afraid of suffering, even before it starts, is because we do not often reckon with the grace of God. The grace of God that comes in when we obey God. When the difficult, it is easier to disobey God, but we remain steadfast in obedience to the Lord. When you make that equation, please don't forget to add on your own side the fact of God's grace. God will give grace to the humble. God will give grace to the obedient. God will give grace to the one that has faith. So when that trouble, whether it is police arresting us or whatever, whatever, don't just look at the difficulty you may have to pass through, but also remember that in that situation, difficult situation in which you're obeying God, God's grace will certainly come in. And that means quite a lot. So the Lord has really taught us this morning. I pray that God will help us so that when it comes to putting into practice what we have learned this morning, we'll be able to do so in Jesus' name. Shall we rise up and go to the Lord and pray? Are you living, cohabiting with somebody who is not your wife? You have heard the word of God. Are you a polygamist? You are living against the will of God. Are you tempted because of difficulties in the family to depart from the right ways of the Lord? You have heard the word of God. He has told you, oh man, what is good. What God requires from you now is obedience. And with obedience, there will be victory. With obedience, 
that we bless him. In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, we thank you this morning for teaching us so much in our search the scriptures session. We pray that these lessons that you have exposed our hearts to this morning will abide with us in Jesus' name. We pray that the courage to stand for the Lord always in every situation, Father, you give unto every one of us in Jesus' name. And we are praying, Lord, because we still have a lot of things to hear from you. We pray that, Lord, you fill us today and teach us and help us to understand everything you have for us this service. Thank you, Lord, for answering our prayers. In Jesus' name, we pray.